The following is a very, very high quality, and uh, I mean, when I say high quality, it's basically flawless, representation of how most fights would result between a knight or warrior when they're facing someone who could actually use magic. <laughs> fire! Fire, fire, fire! Ah! <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> Got him here. <laughs> Knights are screwed. Shadow Greetings, I am Shad, wearing my knightly attire as is appropriate for the subject of this video. I want to explore Knight Fighting Wizard, but of course this is really to talk about the the larger discussion of warriors versus magic. Because there are issues inherent with the presence of magic and how viable and useful warriors would remain in a world with prominent magic. And if it was very accessible and anyone could get it, these kind of get redundant. Because, like, really think about this. Do, how long did we use the sword after the gun was, you know, invented? Longer than you might think, but the better the gun got, all right, the more pointless swords became, the point where they were phased out of warfare completely. So depending on how developed the magic is and how available it is, that could actually make the classic knight or even warrior completely redundant in your setting. But if you want a setting with warriors and magic coinciding, you're going to need to justify why people are still being warriors in the sense of armor, swords, and also the interplay between them. Many different writers, different fantasy settings, have approached this in different ways. And I want to discuss the different ways that you can use, and uh, you can either use one of these ways, or a mix, kind of combined, to uh, see how a warrior, like a knight, would really be able to stand up. How, how would they fight someone who's using high-level magic like Powerful Wizard? So the first one might seem like it's defeating the purpose of seeing how a warrior could still exist in a setting if you just make it that magic is really overpowered and the, the reality could be that no warrior in the right mind would actually stand a chance against a magic user. And it's been done multiple times. I'll reference the Stormlight Archives by Brandon Sanderson, where the magic users, called Surge Binders, they're simply on another level. And if you have, without like looking at different ways to get around it, just a fair fight between a Surge Binder and a regular warrior, the regular warrior is never going to stand a chance unless their Surge Binder is new, untrained, and the warrior is a master and all these things. And there might be ways to get around it, but in just a more fair fight, it's not a chance. And so there are book series and settings that exist where the magic users is way tougher. There's almost no comparison. And in fact, I did that with my own novel in Chronicles of Evolve, Shadow of the Conqueror. The Arch Knights are just really powerful, okay? And a regular warrior isn't gonna stand a chance. The only way you can really be able to fight it is some of the reasons that I'm gonna explain later on, but that's like getting magic and soul and stuff. But if you were to take away all those other ways to try and even the odds or give the warrior an edge, an average warrior with a regular sword, they're not going to win against an arch knight. The way that you can still make a really engaging story is that, of course, you need to give the, um, the magic users challenges, and that can be by facing other magic users, monsters and things like that. And so, of course, you can make a workable story. The other way to still have warriors play a important role in the story with over-the-top magics where even a warrior would not be able to stand a chance against a magic user is by making it rare and hard to obtain. If this type of magic is hard to obtain, not everyone can get it, what is the average person supposed to do? And if someone needs to go on an adventure, fight, wage war, well, they can only get so many magic users if it's a rare thing. So of course they're gonna need regular warriors that are equipped to the technological level of the setting that the setting allows. And you know, that's so you can still have the regular fantasy knight. Still, the problem is when the knight actually comes across the magic user, ooh, it's gonna be tough. 
Now, you might be thinking there are other se uh, story settings that I haven't touched on where the magic users are just completely overpowered compared to the regular warriors. And uh, a good example that kind of comes right into this is the Wheel of Time. But the Wheel of Time actually does something that helps balance it. And this is where we come to the first kind of thing that you can do, and we're going to go through four to five primary things that you can introduce into your setting, and it can be one or multiple, to help balance it out and give warriors an edge, make them still competent or capable of taking on one of these wizards or magic users. And so the first one is the glass cannon. So the idea that you might have been able to get from the example there is that a glass cannon type of magic user is someone who's really, really powerful when they're kind of aware of the threat and they've turned on their magic, but the magic is off, they're a regular person as vulnerable as any other person, and that's actually what they do in the Wheel of Time. The Wheel of Time has two main kind of magics, one for female magic users, one for male magic users, and they operate kind of differently. It's a beautiful setting and series. So, Aes Sedai are really powerful, but the thing is, they are very vulnerable, and what I also really like, most Aes Sedai are not trained warriors. And uh, <laughs> what's interesting is also the book series remains very true to the fact that the average woman is not going to win a fight against the average man, especially one who is trained in combat. Men, on average, are stronger, and there's so many reasons, okay? And so the book series does a really good job of showing that without their magic, I said I actually very vulnerable. And so the warriors still have a major role to play because they they're also rare. They're not, they're not everyone can just be um, a magic user in the setting. But because they're vulnerable, they're aware of this, and so they actually have com male companions called warders who act as their bodyguards to help protect them when they are vulnerable. And there are multiple times when they become vulnerable. They get in a really big magical fight with another Aes Sedai or a male Yolan or else or a Darkspawn or something like that. Their focus is locked. And unless they're aware of the threat, they can still be taken out by an arrow, someone's hitting from, from behind. And there are people in the setting that hunt Aes Sedai and they know their weaknesses and an arrow from a distance that they're not aware of, gone. Okay, and so because of that weakness, the Aes Sedai have male warriors, actual warriors, and some are former knights, even all that stuff, to protect them. So there is still a major role for the knight or warrior in the Wheel of Time setting because of this primary thing. And so you can do that as well, have your magic users could be really powerful, but also really vulnerable. Imagine a magic system that was really, had incredible offensive power, but no defensive capacity. They would be so vulnerable, and there's still a lot of ways the average warrior, archer, you know, knife in the back, anything, could take out these magic users, and that means they're not dominating everything. Really good way to do it. So the next way to try and balance magic users to help warriors still be able to fight them, have a chance against one of thing, is essentially kryptonite, okay? A fatal weakness that can block or turn off the magic or affect them in some way. And again, you can combine multiple things like this because even in Wheel of Time, they also have certain kryptonite effects against the magic that can stop someone from channeling completely. And if you're in a more traditional setting, you could do kind of more traditional things that can help block magic. So in the book that I'm currently writing, which is a medieval setting, I'm actually using iron as a thing that's capable of blocking magic. And also it affects fey creatures. There's a lot of kind of interesting folklore around how iron affects fairies and fey and stuff. I like that idea that I'm going to push 
it even further and have it affect magic completely. That it's actually a, uh, it, it sucks in magic quite a lot. So if you're, if you're holding iron and you're a magic user, any spell you do gets sucked into the iron because it has this interesting interplay with magic. And silver and lead also have interesting interplays with the other types of magic in the setting. And so some can repel and some absorb this type of magic with interesting f effects in the setting. And so that has a really interesting effect, okay? And this will lead into uh, another thing that's kind of related to this, and it's that you can give the magic users very significant weaknesses. This is related to the glass cannon aspect, and it's coming off in an offshoot with the kryptonite aspect. By giving him significant weaknesses, the warriors can exploit it to their advantage. And so if you have something that nullifies their magic, like iron, if it's just close to them or they're touching it, and their magic just gets sucked in the iron and they can't use it, that's a full-on kryptonite. And not only that, it prevents them from wearing armor, like metal armor or iron armor. They might be able to find other metals. Like, that's an interesting thing. Maybe they, like, because in my setting, they'll be able to wear bronze, armor it's not as strong but they could still get some measure of a you know defense because the, uh, the metal doesn't affect the magic but still because most armor available would be made out of steel and steel is like 99% iron nullifying the magic and so they could only wear cloth armor or other things like that which makes them very vulnerable turns them into a bit of a glass cannon aspect as well but they also have a kryptonite and you don't have to just do you know what I'm suggesting or what other people have done you could make up a really interesting thing that nullifies the magic in some way one of the really cool ones that I like out of the traditional Dungeons and Dragons one was arm movement if you were able to take like tie up a wizard in classic D&D &D and I still think they have this aspect in the current versions that um, you can't cast spells that, well, in 3.5, the one that I played, they had, a, I think it was called a somatic component, but that might be spoken. But it's like, it's an interplay because some spells need arm movement and some spells need spoken words. Both those things have a kryptonite aspect to them because if you can take out the magic user from being able to move their arms or speak, you've stopped their magic. That is a type of kryptonite, a type of weakness that a warrior can exploit and the warrior then still has some type of role to play or has a chance in fighting the magic users because they can exploit their weaknesses. Because the interesting thing, a warrior, okay, you know, a classic warrior doesn't have too many weaknesses like that in terms of their combative skill. Yeah, chop an arm, that, that's a type of weakness, but it's hard to achieve that with their armor and stuff like that. They don't have such a weakness you could exploit so easily in aspects of like, an actual material, I get it close to them. And also, if, like for my setting, wizards, you know, iron affects their magic, that means just attacking them with steel weapons can nullify the magic if you get close enough. That's a severe weakness that, of course, affects how prominently wizards can logically be used on battlefields. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Classic. Well, here you go. <sighs> All right, so the next thing that you can do to help give your warriors an edge against really high-powered magics in your setting and whatnot is to give the warriors their own type of magic. Doesn't need to be the same, doesn't need to be as powerful, because if you're going the route, and you don't need to do this, because there are some magic kind of uh, systems that actually involve being very capable and strong. Like, funny example, Dragon Ball Z. Dragon Ball Z actually has a lot of magic in it, and it has a magic system, but the magic system is directly tied to their physical strength, and the stronger they get physically, the more powerful their magic becomes, their key, right? Uh, so you can actually have magic tied with physical capacity, but more traditional magic systems don't have that for thematic storytelling things, also for balance, and I think it's very fair and good to have a balance effect like this, where the people who use the magic because they're either devoting all their lives training and focus to get good at it or it actually has an effect on their physical stature and strength that they become more weaker physically that gives the warriors some type of edge but it usually doesn't get them nearly as far as counterbalancing the insane power that the magic users get thanks to the magic. And so to get them the rest of the way down to a more even level, you can give them just a little bit of a boost in some type of magic. And it could be, say, a key related kind of martial arts kind of thing, that where they get so good uh, with their physical training, they start to be able to achieve supernatural levels of combative ability that usually wouldn't be able to, well, of course we wouldn't see in the real world, but you can just say, because this setting is fantasy, that they get Get so fast that they move so quickly it's like you can't even see it and they can they jump like so they're jumping far and because what's interesting right when you see the highest level olympic athletes perform some of their greatest feats 
it does appear superhuman. The height that they can reach in their jumps and the speed that they can reach. And so if you could make those levels a little bit more common and push them even a bit further, they can you know, get beyond even these levels we see at the Olympics. Well, you're giving certain supernatural abilities that don't seem completely uh, like magical, but still push like in the, you know, kind of supernatural martial arts thing which gives the Warriors a bit of an edge against the Magic users. Like, think about a, an example. Roni Kenshin, one of my favorite animes, okay, I love it. He's a superhuman, but it, people don't acknowledge that he is blessed by some magical power, or he, well, unless you consider Ki as the magical power, or a god is enhancing him, or he was bitten by a radioactive thing, or there's no magic apart from that, the, the concept of Ki, inner power, that you train so insanely good that you get to these insane, truly superhuman levels of combat. Now, I could picture someone like Kenshin having a much greater chance in combating a wizard than a regular warrior because he's, in, he's superhuman fast and his skills are so great. And so you could marry those concepts together in a setting and the warriors could kind of get to a close level. The other option is to actually give the warriors access to a type of magic. In the Wheel of Time, the warders are actually physically stronger and more capable than regular people because of a bond that the magic makes between them and the Aes Sedai. They, they actually have, and they usually can get access to magical weapons as well, and things, we'll get to magical weapons next. But there are other things that you can use magic to enhance the warriors in ways that a regular wizard or magic user wouldn't be able to get. And that can bring them on an even level. I've been doing something like that in my, the book I'm currently writing, that there is a separate magic warriors can access, which is related to the regular magic, but the way they access it through their martial training manifests in different ways. So they're not like a magic user shooting fireballs, but the magic manifests in certain moves that they do in their martial capacity to achieve certain supernatural powers. Again, bring the warrior back onto an even level with the wizard and uh, to have a more balanced kind of thing, to have more different, it's kind of character class balance or really talking about here, because you want, swords are awesome. You don't want swords to be nullified because people are throwing fireballs. You need a way to fix it. And so the next one is somewhat related to the kryptonite one, and uh, but it's more direct, it's more impactful and everything. Whereas before you need to get the, you know, the kryptonite to touch the magic user and everything like that. The other way is just to have anti-magic capacity. <laughs> yeah. No, no, please, 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 please. A special charm or something that people lift up that blocks the magic completely and protects themselves, or even like an anti-magic field or even anti-magic armor. That is a huge kind of kryptonite level effect that could return they would make being a magic user far more vulnerable and difficult. They would have to be a, try and be aware of this anti-magic that people can use. Now, this has been used into some really cool effects in stories already. I'll reference the Wheel of Time. I won't give spoilers, but a character in the Wheel of Time series eventually comes across a special kind of pendant that protects him from the magic completely. But it does it so much that it also has some negative effects because when he's injured, he can't get healed by the magic unless they, people take the pendant off of him. So... That's a cool kind of interplay, strength, weakness, that comes with that kind of thing, but you can definitely do that. And it's related to the kryptonite thing, just in a more direct way. And finally, the last one that I'll talk about, though I do want to hear other suggestions you have in the comments below, is what magic items, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Burn! Burn! <laughs> Smoke! Smoke! <clears throat> you don't necessarily need to give the warriors magical capacity themselves if you have magic items that enhance their abilities, increase their protection, increase their offensive capacity just because it's magic and D, D we do and traditional fantasy we see that all the time even in very traditional fantasy going back look at king arthur sword in the stone okay excalibur magic sword and this, these magic items could have any number of effects related to the previous things that we've talked about it could be a type of kryptonite the magic you, you know uses your fighting it could protect you from the magic completely okay it could deflect things it could enhance your physical capacity depending on what type of enchantments or it could just give you certain magical abilities that the magic users usually have and you have it because you have the item and classic dnd has a whole host of 
classic magical items. What are some of the classes? Like Ring of Protection, the Cloak of Elvenkind, plus one sword. <laughs> now, but, uh, plus one swords, if you integrate them appropriately, you could make it really crazy, because essentially a plus one sword is, in, like with classic D&D mechanics, is indestructible to regular weapons except magical weapons. And so if you had them much more rare, okay, um, and like the plus one sword would essentially be a sword that never dulls, always keeps its edge, and can never be, uh, can't be destroyed by the weapons. That's insanely powerful. Excalibur could have been like a, a plus one weapon, but indeed it is like a plus because mechanically it only gives you a plus one to attack and defense. But the actual integration of the how it functions in the world is really powerful stuff. Never rusts, never dulls, it always keeps its edge, you never need to sharpen it. That's a bloody awesome weapon! And you could introduce other interesting mechanics that, again, could favour warriors over magic users in the sense that the magic user's own capacity for the magic interferes with the enchantments of these items because they're of essentially the same type of magic. And it could be that they deflect or absorb or warp the magic the magic user is trying to project to the point where the magic user can't even wear these magic items as a result. But if you're not a magic user, you can. And again, kind of balancing thing. And uh, so there we go. These are the classic ones that I want to talk about with you and also give examples that already exist in stories, literature, world settings and stuff that how it's been employed in different ways. Did I miss any? I'd love to hear some additional thoughts you have of ways that could help the warriors fight these magic users uh, in interesting, fun ways to... And look, Again, going back to the start, you don't even need to do that if you do want your story where the magic users are just on another level. But you do need to consider, if you still want warriors, how those warriors would exist logically in the world, what function are they fulfilling to justify their existence. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you next time here on Shadowversity. So until that time, farewell. And now, I got some wizards to slay.